Hello, my name is Jonathan Sullivan and I want to welcome you to this presentation Using New Media for Professional Catechetical Development. I'd like to start this presentation as I like to start all my presentations with a brief prayer. This is the Prayer for New Evangelization which has been published by the USCCB. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Gracious and merciful God, we pray that through the Holy Spirit all Catholics may hear the call of the new evangelization and seek a deeper relationship with your Son, Jesus. We pray that the new evangelization will renew the Church, inspiring all Catholics to go forth and make disciples of all nations and transform society through the power of the Gospel. We pray for all members of the Church that we heed the words of Christ, Do not be afraid and strengthened by the Holy Spirit's gift of courage, give witness to the Gospel and share our faith with others. We pray that we may become like the father of the prodigal son, filled with compassion for our missing brothers and sisters, and run to embrace them upon their return. We pray that all people yearning to know Christ and the Church may encounter Him through the faithful who witness to His love in their lives. Loving God, our Father, Strengthen us to become witnesses to the saving grace of your Son, Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Again, welcome. My name is Jonathan Sullivan. I'm the Director of Catechetical Services for the Diocese of Springfield in Illinois. I'm also a member of the Technology Committee of the National Conference for Catechetical Leadership. I host the Catechetical Leader Podcast, and my wife and I will be celebrating 12 years of marriage next month, and we have five children at home. I'd also like to thank our sponsors for this presentation today, the National Association of Parish Catechetical Directors, the National Conference of Catechetical Leadership, and the Diocese of Springfield in Illinois. I thank them for their support and for spreading the word about this webinar. Briefly, I'd like to just go over the outline of this presentation. I'm going to start by discussing why professional development is important for catechists and catechetical leaders, talk a little bit about the strengths that new media bring to the question of professional development, and then give some general tips on using new media to connect with others. Then we'll dive into the meat of the presentation, which will be actually looking at some specific services and how we can use them for professional development. We'll take a look at Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, blogs, podcasts, and webinars, and we'll close with a short closing prayer. I do want to give one quick caveat, though. Uh, during that main section of the presentation, we will be going live to the Internet, and there's always some danger inherent in that. You never know what kind of things will actually pop up on these different services. I don't think there should be anything uh, shocking or immoral, but if there is, we'll get it off the screen as quickly as possible and move on. So with that, let's ask the question, why is professional development important? And I can think of three reasons off the top of my head why professional development is something we should be concerning ourselves with. First, it's part of our own ongoing personal conversion in the faith. Uh, as catechists and catechetical leaders, we need to be continually uh, turning our hearts to God, turning our hearts to Christ, and, and making ourselves more and more disciples. The National Directory for Catechesis puts it this way, like all Christians, catechists are called to continual conversation and growth in their faith, and for this reason are called to ongoing spiritual formation. The catechist should continue his or her spiritual formation through frequent reception of the sacraments, especially the Holy Eucharist and reconciliation, through spiritual direction, and through continued study of the faith. The catechist should also be provided with opportunities for spiritual growth, such as retreats, conferences, etc. In addition to spiritual formation, the catechist is also in need of pedagogical formation, especially as society, teaching methods, and culture change. Really what this is, is it's modeling adult faith formation. Just as we don't expect adults to stop learning about the faith, growing in the faith after they receive confirmation in eighth grade, we expect it to be an ongoing part of their lives. So too for us as catechists and catechetical leaders. It's a way that we can show others that you never stop learning, you never stop growing. Uh, this is a, a lifelong endeavor. And so we can be an example of that to the folks in our parishes and in our dioceses. And finally, professional development is about reading the signs of the times. It, it helps us to see what others are doing in the field, to see what the new resources are, new books and articles, uh, as well as <laughs> just engaging in conversation with others and, and uh, making sure that we're on top of the newest developments in, in what the church is saying about specific issues, as well as pedagogical uh, techniques and things like that. So uh, it, it's a way to continually be keeping on top of this great ministry that we love. 
So why use new media in particular for professional development? I think new media has a number of strengths that really lend itself to professional development. For one thing, new media is social. Uh, and I'll be using the term social media and new media fairly, fairly interchangeably. But it's social. It's not just reading a book or an article on your own, although there's nothing wrong or bad about that, obviously. We want people to be reading uh, about the latest things in catechesis. But new media allows for interaction. It allows us to contact that author of that article or that book and ask them questions and ask them to clarify something that may not have been clear. New media allows us to share uh, different resources that we found with others. And so it's not just us isolated uh, in our parishes, but we can reach out to others and, and make this a real collaborative, community-centered uh, endeavor. Second, new media is cheap. Um, most of the stuff I'll be talking about today you know, has no real cost associated with it. Uh, there's no need to pay for this kind of content. Uh, people are putting it out freely, and so it's very budget-friendly. I know that's something we're all concerned about these days. Next, new media is easy. Uh, there's lots of good tools out there that allow the content to come to you. And um, we'll be talking a little bit about RSS feeds in a little bit. But it's a technology that instead of having to go out to each individual website and see if there's anything to new, that allow that new content to come to you in a much easier way than in the past. New media is non-synchronous. That means you don't have to interact in real time. Uh, one person may be adding a comment in the evening, someone else in the morning, someone else during their lunch break. Um, it, you don't, excuse me, you don't have to have that immediate back and forth that you do in a face-to-face -face interaction. This is especially good for folks like me who are introverts because it allows us to take our time to formulate responses and questions, uh, lets you type out things and edit them before you post them. Uh, so it can be a real help to introverts who may not speak up in more face-to-face -face types of interactions. New media is global. Uh, as one person's put it, it, it helps us to overcome the tyranny of geography. This is especially good for folks in rural parishes and rural dioceses who may not have access to large theological centers or universities because now those resources are available online. So even if you don't have something in your immediate location, you don't have to forego that kind of access to those kinds of resources. I like to tell people engaging in new media is like attending a worldwide conference that never ends. There's always a possibility for one of those hallway conversations or to find something new. And finally, new media allows you to cultivate your PLN, that's your personal or professional learning network. And this isn't a new idea. People have always kind of surrounded themselves with peers and colleagues, folks you could bounce ideas off of and share resources with. But new media allows you to expand that even further uh, so that anyone engaged in new media can be a a part of your learning circle and help you to learn new skills and, and help you find new things. Real quick, a few general tips on uh, using new media, and this is just from my own interactions with folks online and some mistakes I, I commonly see people make. When you sign up for a lot of these different services like Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter, First of all, make sure you add a profile picture. That's really important to help people to identify you in those different services. I know when I use Twitter, I don't actually usually look at the name or the, the Twitter handle. It's usually the picture that allows me to immediately recognize who's posting what or who's saying what. Uh, and when people don't put a profile picture and just leave that default picture there, it makes it much harder to identify who's saying something uh, and also can make your account look like it might be a spam account. A lot of spam accounts on Twitter and other places don't bother putting a picture up, and so you may be uh, just disregarded as spam if you don't do that. Same thing with filling out your biography and other information on these sites. It just helps people to put you into a context so that they know, oh, this is a parish catechetical leader, or this is a university professor. It helps people know why they're going to want to connect with you, what kind of expertise and interests you bring to the conversation. And then finally, make sure you introduce yourself. And this is especially important on Facebook and LinkedIn, uh, as, I've, as I've seen it. Whenever I do presentations or give webinars, oftentimes people afterwards will want to connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook, but they don't give me any context. So they'll just leave the generic uh, message up when they connect, and it doesn't let me know who they are or how they found me. So when you do that, <coughs> excuse me, when you connect with someone, make sure you type in a little message there and just let them know, hey, I saw you uh, on this presentation, I want to connect with you, or we met at this meeting. Uh, it's just a nice way to, again, help people to contextualize who you are and why they're going to want to connect with you. So with that, let's go online and take a look at some examples 
of ways that you can use new media for professional development. And the first service I want to take a look at here is Facebook, and this is probably one that most of us will be familiar with. Uh, Facebook has you know, hundreds of millions of users. Chances are you're on it. Uh, but there's ways that you can use Facebook besides just posting pictures of children or uh, uh, interacting with family and friends. There's actually <coughs> excuse me, lots of organizations that have Facebook pages or groups. And what we're looking at right now is a Facebook group, which is a little bit different from a page. Uh, the, way, the distinction I like to make is a group is kind of a public discussion place that an individual or an organization has put up. And this example here is the group page of the National Association of Parish Catechetical Directors. And so Lori is the administrator here for that. And you can see she's put up a little notice from NCEA about looking for presenters for their convention next year. But as you scroll down, you'll also see other people who have just posted their own things. This is really like a public forum where anyone can come in and just post something. And you'll see interactions and people commenting and liking different things. Uh, <laughs> it's a little space that people can come to and uh, just add their own interests about parish catechesis. Now, this particular one, if you notice up here at the top, the little uh, icon, the little closed lock, this means that it's a closed group. Now, that means anyone can ask to join, but the administrator has to allow them uh, access to it after they've asked to join. So that means that no one's just going to be able to see anything that's supposed to here, but only people that have been given permission. But you see there's different things you can do. You can write a post, you can add a photo or a video, ask a question. They have a little built-in poll feature, which is really nice. You can even upload a file. So if you've got a, a workshop PDF or something like that that you want to share with folks, you can do that right here in the group. So when you're using groups, what you want to do is you want to start conversations. You want to write a post, ask a question, and comment on other participants' posts as well. The next thing we're going to take a look at is the page of the National Conference for Catechetical Leadership. Now, we just looked at a group. Now, this is a page. And again, the main distinction is the page is more controlled by the organization. Uh, it's, people can post to it, but it's not as well suited to that kind of open discussion area. But that doesn't mean you can't use this for catechetical development. Obviously, you're going to want to follow and interact with organizations and individuals who are sharing resources and offering comments and interesting things online. So again, as we scroll down here, we can see that NCCL has shared links to different articles and blog posts from different places uh, around the web. So when you're using a page, what you want to do is you really want to add comments to what the organization has posted. And then the really nice feature, and this is really what makes pages useful, is on each of the things that the page shares, you see the little share button here. And if you click on that, you can actually use that and will post it to your own Facebook page so that you can share what this organization or this individual has posted with all the people you're connected with on Facebook. It's a really nice and easy way to help spread the word about different things that are out there. There's one more thing on Facebook I want to discuss, and this is a relatively new feature, and that's Facebook lists. Lists are a way that individuals can create lists of pages. And so if you come over on the right side here, you can see I've created a Catholic Catechesis list that has 26 different pages in it at the moment. And you actually click on this, and you can see a list of all the pages that I've added to this Catechesis list. And it's just various publishers and individuals and organizations that are posting things about Catechesis on Facebook. Now, anyone can follow this list. Uh, if you go to the link for the list, if you're on Facebook, you can click a little follow button, and then instead of having to go to all these individual pages and follow them individually, you can just follow this list. I've already curated this list for you, so you don't have to do the work, the work yourself. So this is going to be a really easy way to uh, quickly follow a bunch of stuff on Facebook without having to do all the work yourself. So that kind of covers Facebook. I want to take a look now at LinkedIn. And if you're familiar with LinkedIn, LinkedIn is a professional social networking site. It's a place where you can post your resume, and you can also connect with people that you're involved with professionally. So if you think of Facebook as kind of family and friends, LinkedIn is colleagues and peers. 
LinkedIn also has a group feature, and there's a number of Facebook or uh, LinkedIn groups that are dedicated to catechesis. In this case, the, the example we're looking at here is the Adult Faith Formation Professionals group on LinkedIn. And this is a great, very active group that has conversations and things that are going on. You can see, uh, kind of similar to Facebook, you can start a discussion just by typing something in, or you can ask a question or a poll through this little feature. And then anyone who's a member of this group can comment and react to whatever your discussion or poll is. As you go down, you can see various conversations that are going on. You know, this particular one has 25 comments, so you can see this is a fairly active group. Like the other group we saw on Facebook, this is a closed group, which means you'll have to ask for permission to enter, but as long as you've demonstrated on Facebook or on LinkedIn, put it in there and shown that you're a professional in catechesis, uh, chances are you're going to be let in. You'll be able to, to take part in those conversations. So again, with this one, what you want to do to really interact well is to ask questions, answer questions, comment on what other people have put up, share good resources. That's the way you can use a LinkedIn group to find out more about catechesis. Now let's take a look at Twitter. And Twitter is actually the main site that I use for professional development. And that may seem a little strange at first. But when you find all these great catechists on Twitter and discover that they're sharing links and things, it's a really great way to find out what's going on very quickly in catechesis. Now, one of the main tools on Twitter for doing that is what's called the hashtag. And if I go up here to the, uh, the search bar here, you can see uh, I've already got a number of hashtags that I search on, on a regular basis. What a hashtag is, is it's basically just a way of marking a topic within the conversation. And uh, you can even see some in some of these tweets here. So this one here, he's used the hashtag church. And that just means that he's put the pound sign or the number sign before a word. And what Twitter does then is when that occurs, it turns that word into a link. And if you click on it, it will actually take you to all the tweets that have that hashtag in it. And so it's a way of following a topic or following a conversation. A really popular one in Catholic circles on Twitter is the hashtag CathMedia which is short for Catholic media. It's a way of marking tweets that are related to Catholic new media. And so you can see lots of people sharing ideas and links and different things about Catholic new media. Now the really nice thing about hashtags is a lot of conferences are starting to use them to encourage people to post information during a conference. So for instance, a couple months ago when I was at the NCCL conference in San Diego, we used the hashtag NCCL2012 to mark the 2012 NCCL conference. And as I was listening to keynotes and involved in uh, different presentations and listening to speakers, I would actually tweet the different things that they were saying and just little ideas and things that would occur to me as that was going on. And so it was a way to share with my followers what I was seeing in the conference, even if they couldn't be there. And lots of conferences are doing that. So if you can identify conference hashtags, it's a great way to kind of virtually join the conference. Obviously, you're not going to get the benefit of actually being there live, uh, but you at least get to see what some of the ideas are and what people are talking about at that conference. So it's a great way to interact and get ideas even if you can't be there yourself. Another nice feature of Twitter is lists. Uh, and this is very similar to the Facebook list. It's just a way of kind of grouping uh, different people around certain topics. And so I've created a catechesis list on Twitter, which is a list of everyone on Twitter that I'm following and know of that's involved in some way in Catholic education or adult faith formation or youth ministry, anything related to catechesis in the church. And you can see I've actually got 229 different people in that list. Now, the nice thing, too, about Twitter is you know, Twitter's kind of a fire hose. There's lots of people adding stuff to Twitter all the time. By creating lists, it helps you to kind of narrow down what you're following at any given moment. And so if I just want to see my folks on catechesis, I can go to that list and just see the catechesis stuff. I've also got lists for news and politics and some local stuff here in Springfield. Just as, so that I'm not missing stuff that I may want to see, I can narrow down what I'm looking at at any given moment. After Twitter, I just want to talk briefly about Google+. This is still a relatively new social network. Uh, it has a lot of the same features as Twitter, except a set of lists which you create are called circles. 
which again are very similar to lists. In this case, I've got a circle on catechesis and education in the church, and so it's all the people I'm following on Google Plus that are sharing those types of things. But one of the nice things about this is you can share your circles as well with folks and post them, and so people can see what you're doing. See right down here, you got the share this circle. If I click on that, if I hit share here now, that's going to post to my uh, profile on Google Plus, and we'll share with everyone, everyone that I think, hey, these are some folks you, if you're interested in catechesis, these are folks you may want to follow. One of the big differences, though, between Google Plus and Twitter is the Hangout feature, and this is a really cool feature. What it basically allows you to do is to start a video chat with people. Uh, if you've got a webcam on your computer and a microphone, you can have real-time face-to-face interactions with folks on Google+. And what a lot of people are doing is actually setting up times to do Hangouts. So they may say, you know, on this date at this time, we're going to hang out on Google+, and discuss uh, the gear of faith, or adult faith formation, or this particular program. And if you're interested, you know, show up and we'll just have a conversation. It's really nice having that face-to-face -face interaction and really helps to personalize your community when you can have that kind of uh, more face-to-face -face visual and vocal communication with folks. So if you're on Google+, Plus, you know, follow folks you're interested in, but start a hangout every once in a while around a topic. Just say, hey, if you're interested, we're going to be discussing this topic. Uh, come and join us. Before we move on, I want to discuss RSS real quick because it will be important to the next uh, couple of features that we'll be talking about. RSS stands for Real Simple Syndication, and it's a technology that allows new content from websites to come to you. You know, 10 or 12 years ago, if you wanted to find out if a website had posted anything new recently, you had to type in that URL and go to that website and look and see if there was new information there. If there wasn't, it was kind of a waste of your time. RSS changed all of that. RSS allows websites to set up what are called feeds, and something new is added to that feed every time something new appears on the website. This is really uh, the start of blogs. The blogs really made good use of this. What people can do then is if you have a feed on your website, users can subscribe to that feed using something called a feed reader. And a feed reader is just a program or a website that you can go to that will aggregate all those feeds into one place. So that instead of going to all the different blogs and websites you're interested in, you just go to your feed reader and it will show all the updates from your websites. And I can actually show you what that looks like. I use a service called Google Reader. Uh, it's through Google. And it's allowed me to subscribe to all the different websites that I'm interested in. And some are catech catechesis related, some are just funny web comics and things like that. We can see every time there's something new, it shows up here, and I can actually click right into it and read what it is. If I click on the title here, it'll actually take me directly to that website. So I can read the whole thing, or then if I want to add a comment at the end, I can do that right there. Now, in order to subscribe, what you're going to want to look for is this icon here. This is the RSS icon, and you'll see this on just about every website nowadays. After you've signed up for something like Google Reader, when you click on that icon, it will guide you through the steps to add that to your reader so that instead of having to go back to that website every time there's something new, you just check in every day on your feed reader. It will show you what's new on all those websites. So let's take a look then at blogs. Blogs are a great way to do professional development because there are so many people out there sharing information, offering information, sharing comments and thoughts and ideas and programs. Uh, you know, there's way too many to, to mention in this presentation, but uh, I want to use this one here as, a, as an example because really Joe Paprocki's blog is really kind of the granddaddy of, of catechesis blogs. Catechist Journey has been around uh, for a number of years now, and Joe is constantly adding great new ideas, great new information, and has really, helped, really been intentional about cultivating a community around his blog, people who comment on it and offer their own ideas and suggestions. And so this is when you really want to look at if you're interested in catechesis in the church. Joe just does a great job uh, putting out ideas. He's doing a retreat right now around the Year of Faith, a daily video with reflections in it. So that's when you're definitely wanting to take a look at. 
So to connect with blogs, like I said, subscribe to the RSS, and here you can see Joe's got his little icon right there. Click on that, and that will take you to his feed. Sometimes, too, though, a lot of them will have an email option. If you don't want to go the RSS route, you can sign up to receive an email, <coughs> an email excuse me, every time there's something new posted to the blog. If you just put your email in there, uh, those will be sent to you. Obviously, the other big thing you want to do with a blog is leave a comment. Uh, whether you want to challenge something that they said, if you don't quite understand what they're saying, or if you have a question you want to clarify something, or just to encourage them. Let me tell you, as a blogger, bloggers love it when you just say, hey, nice job, I really like this, this was really useful. Uh, it helps us to know what is good to share and what may or may not be as helpful as we may think. So giving feedback, positive or negative, really help bloggers to make sure that they're addressing what you want to hear and what your needs are. One other thing to do, and really I, I'm encouraging more and more people to do this nowadays, start a blog of your own. They're very, very uh, easy to set up nowadays with services like WordPress or Blogger. You can have a free blog up and running literally in a matter of minutes. And people sometimes wonder, well, you know, I don't know what to post. You know, there's no right content for a blog. It's whatever you're thinking about on a given day or whatever you're interested in. Don't worry about producing the right content. And, and don't feel like you have to have something perfectly polished either. Blogs really aren't places for final ideas. They're really more like places to post drafts of ideas. And what will happen is people will fill in the gaps for you in the comments. They'll say, hey, did you think about this? Or I really like what you have to say here, but did you consider this aspect of it? They'll ask clarifying questions. and and help you to really hone your thoughts. So like I said, try that. Uh, go to WordPress.com or Blogspot.com, uh, and that will uh, you can have something up and running literally in just a matter of minutes. Somewhat related to blogs are podcasts. Podcasts are like internet radio shows that you can download and listen to on your computer or on your iPod or other MP3 player. They're like an audio blog. And there unfortunately aren't a whole lot around catechesis. Uh, we could really use some more catechetical podcasts. But the one I've got up here is the best youth ministry podcast ever, maybe, <laughs> which is hosted by the Diocese of San Jose. They, uh, every few weeks, will get together around a microphone and just have a conversation around different topics. So their last one was about uh, spouses in youth ministry. They've talked about transitioning youth uh, from the youth ministry to the regular parish. Uh, using social media as a volunteer. So a lot of the, the topics on this podcast uh, are for youth ministry, but they're also applicable to plenty of other catechetical topics as well. So I really encourage you. It's a really great podcast. It's about 30 minutes. And the great thing about podcasts is they're something that you can do for professional development when you don't have time to read. Uh, in my household, uh, one of my jobs is to do the dishes after dinner, and that's when I listen to podcasts. I just plug in my MP3 player, put on my headphones, and I can do a little professional development while I'm washing the dishes. Uh, most of these podcasts, and this one, are about 30 minutes long, so they're just about right for doing the dishes and cleaning up after dinner. So a great way to get a little professional development in uh, on the road, you know, listen to them in the car, those sorts of things. We don't have time to read or just don't have the ability to read because you're doing something else. And then the last services I really want to talk about are webinars and online conferences. And, and webinars uh, you should probably be familiar with if you're listening to this uh, or have participated in any of my other webinars. Little times when you can get online and listen to a presenter and ask them questions. We're also seeing more and more online conferences. Uh, and I've participated in a few of those uh, more around technology topics than catechesis. But there are opportunities to go online and actually hear a speaker talk and do little uh, interactions with them. This is one that's going to be coming up on August 23rd. Uh, my friends at Peter and Paul Ministries are hosting this. Apostles in New Media, a little mini conference they're doing in the evening from about 6.30 to 8.30 Central Time on August 23rd. They're going to have three different speakers talking about uh, great leaders in Catholic communication and new media. If you go to their website, peterandpaulministries.com, you can get more information on that and participate in a little mini online conference. Uh, something a little bigger than a webinar, uh, but something that should be a lot of fun, it should be really interesting. But the thing I always tell people to remember about webinars and online conferences is, even if you can't go, even if the time isn't good for you, go ahead and sign up anyway. Uh, my, uh, what I've seen is about 60 to 70% of the time, 
whenever someone does a webinar or a conference like this, they're recording it, and they'll make that recording available to anyone after the fact. And so if you go ahead and sign up, you'll get an email with a link afterwards saying, hey, here was the webinar, here's the link to it, thanks a lot, you know, something like that. Uh, you can also go back and check the archives. Oftentimes, uh, companies will archive all their webinars. I know Ave Maria Press has done a number of webinars and has uh, archived all of those on their website, so you can go back and look at all their adult faith formation webinars. Uh, a great way to uh, catch up if you haven't been able to participate in those in the past. Really good information, really good speakers there. And that's kind of the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, just want to end with a quick closing prayer. Uh, just do the, uh, the Hail Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Thank you so much for listening to this presentation. You can get my notes for this presentation as well as links to all of the services that I talked about at my website, jonathanfsullivan.com. You connect with me on Twitter at Sully Joe and on Facebook at facebook.com slash jonathanfsullivan. Please feel free to leave me a comment or send me a note through my website. I love hearing from folks who've listened to my presentations. I love your feedback. Let me know what you liked and what you didn't like. And if you have any suggestions for future webinars I can do, I'd love to hear those as well. Thank you again. God bless you, and take care.